Well, the title of the message this morning, I think I put it in the bulletin, says, Some things are non-negotiable. Some things are just non-negotiable. And each and every one of you got things in your life that are non-negotiable. I had a brother tell me the other day about him and his little kids, you know. And there's just some things ain't going to happen to them little kids without me turning real flesh man real quick, you know. There's things that are just non-negotiable in our lives. I'm going to read a story or go over a story here uh, from um, Marcus Luttrell, Navy SEAL. In 2005, on June 28th, Four Navy SEAL commandos were on a mission in Afghanistan searching for a notorious al-Qaeda terrorist leader hiding in a Taliban stronghold. In, as the battle ensued, three of the SEALs were killed, and the fourth, Marcus uh, Luttrell, was blasted unconscious by a rocket grenade and blown over a cliff. Severely injured, he spent the next four days fighting off six al-Qaeda assassins who were sent to finish him off. And then he crawled for seven miles through the mountains before he was taken in by a local tribe who risked everything that they had to protect him from the encircling Taliban killers. See, they took Latrell back to their village where the law of hospitality was a non-negotiable law. And it took hold. It was that, that's the way they felt. In his book, Lone Survivor, Marcus wrote, quote, they were committed to defend me against the Taliban until there was no one left alive, unquote. There was a non-negotiable law of hospitality for those local tribesmen, and that's how they believe. The law of hospitality is very strong in the Middle Eastern culture. Some of us know that firsthand because we've been there, and it has been that way forever and ever and ever. It prompted Abraham to offer food to three strangers, and it wasn't like, come on in and have a sandwich. Those three strangers, as you know, if you remember the story, was two angels and God himself. Amen. And, but he, it wasn't just like come in and have a sandwich or let me fire up the grill and have a hamburger. It was go get the goat or, I mean, go get the sheep, the lamb, the slaughter, the calf, whatever it was, and eat the meat, you know, prepare the meat. This took time. And that's how they feel today. The Middle Eastern culture is still very hospitable. And that's the, that's the way they feel. It was this same law that prompted Lot in the very next chapter to bring in those two angels, those two men, into his home and take care of them. It was a non-negotiable law of hospitality. And while Lot's idea of how to protect them is appalling to us, these, this, this whole gr group of people that wanted to rape these, new, these two men, he offered up his virgin daughters. That's, that's not happening in my house. You know what I'm saying? But that's the hospitality. That's the law of non-negotiable. Whatever means, it doesn't matter to be hospitable to these two, these two folks. It's so strong that it supersedes our obligation to our families and to our own lives. I'm going to be reading from Daniel. It's a long set of scripture. Daniel chapter 1, first one verse 1 through 16. If you want to follow along, and I've got the King James Version up here, I think. In the third year of the reign of Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, ne came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and he besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, the part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had ability to them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereby they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. 
But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should we see your face for why should he see your faces worse likening than the children which are of your sort? Then shall he make me in danger you make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Mazar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee in the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented them in this manner and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. Sometimes our stand for truth can become an inconvenience. Daniel's standing for the truth was an inconvenience. And it also put him in an unpredictable situation. Uncomfortable situation or circumstances. Almost, a predictable, almost obviously predictable that he would have his head removed by not doing what he should. In fact, Melazar was really concerned about taking away the king's portion of meat and wine because if the king saw the, the countenance of those four individuals that didn't fare the rest, his head would be taken off. And yet he, Daniel found favor with God and was granted that. And then he even looked better than the rest of them. Our stand for the truth should be non-negotiable. Our stand for faith should be non-negotiable for us. And if it is, it will place you and me in inconvenient situations in our life. It will place us in some very uncomfortable circumstances in our lives. And the decisions that we get ready to make, especially around those that are not of God, puts us in that inconvenience. If you're not currently feeling inconvenient about anything during the day, just any given day, I'm talking about every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. If you don't find yourself in an inconvenient situation or an uncomfortable circumstance, you need to right now take a look at your relationship with God. I'm just telling you like it is. If you get through an entire day and didn't feel uncomfortable or inconvenienced in any way, then something's wrong with your relationship with God. Because this world has fell apart. And I'll tell you, within two hours of leaving this church, you're going to have a circumstance that you'll feel inconvenient or uncomfortable in. Some of these little things I threw out here is like when a boss suggests that you lie to keep your job. I don't know, may not come right up to you and say you need to lie. They might say something like, uh, well, you know what I mean. Just get it done at all cost, you know. We have a guy here that almost retired, and they called him in and asked him about using a cheater pipe. Everybody uses cheater pipes in his business, but they had it out for him. And all he had to do was look at him and say, no, I did not use it. Instead, he said, I can't, I, I can't tell you a lie. Yeah, I used it, and they let him go. But God blessed him with a business after that. Amen? How many of you all seen Courageous? Have you are. Javier was in there. He knew he was going to lose his job. It was showing you that if you, are, if you have non-negotiable faith, non-negotiable integrity and honesty based on God's biblical principles, you're going to do what Javier did. And Javier knew he was going to lose his job. His wife, when she answered the phone, was telling him, it's okay, baby, it's okay, baby, it's okay, baby. Because she knew he'd lost his job because that's the way the world runs today. But his true integrity and faith and honesty got him a promotion instead. Amen. You know, when the guys at work or when you're out and about and those filthy jokes are going on that you used to laugh at, if you don't feel inconvenient, then you need to look at your relationship with God today. Yeah. There's all kinds of things. 
or years that we talk like that. When, <laughs> that's me included. When when the cashier gives you back more money than you should have you should have got back, there's your your honesty again. How we respond to such times will determine the quality of our walk with God. It'll de- it'll it will determine and define our intimate relationship with Jesus and how strong it is. People take advantage of things and they 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 convince themselves it's okay to do things under the table. Get making extra money doing something that's not of God. Well, I'm not talking about the item itself. I'm talking about you you're not supposed to be even doing that, but you're doing it anyway, but you're getting paid cash so nobody knows. Hello. Jesus best describes our state in his prayer. In John 17, 14 through 16, he said, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them. I didn't know if I had it all in there or not. <laughs> world, but thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. If we are of the world, we're not of God. If we go go with the world, we're not going with God. We are aliens to this world because we are not of this world. We are we we don't belong here. Amen. Our spirit is in constant turmoil with our flesh because our flesh leans towards the world and our spirit leans towards God. Amen. We are strangers to this world because we do not understand the values of this world. The more intimate you become with Jesus, the more you just can't understand why the laws are the way they are, why the world's doing what it's doing, why our country has chosen to do some of the things it's doing, some of the things that are socially acceptable, politically correct, and our minds just can't take that because we get closer with the Lord and we say, that's that's just not right. It's not right. We must never forget that our home and our allegiance is to heaven. Amen? Not Not of this world. Daniel worked in a land that was hostile to the faith that he held. It was hostile. His bosses were some of the most powerful, most ruthless and egotistical men, kings, that there ever was in ancient history. To contradict these men would mean death. It would mean off with your head. None of us have to worry about that yet, but yet we still, we're such wimpy Christians. The book of Daniel is a record of many times that Daniel placed, Daniel's faith placed him in these inconvenient situations. The book of Daniel is an awesome book to show you some of the times that people took, t- stood firm on the faith, even though it could mean their lives. And we don't even have to worry about that yet, but we're on our way. It was the atmosphere that Daniel stood firm with, non-negotiable faith. Is your faith non-negotiable? Or do you take Satan's compromises that he's selling to us on a daily basis? Daniel knew that it meant to have this faith would put him in these inconvenient places. His faith put him in front of a king that wanted a dream interpreted. And if he didn't interpret it, he would be off with his head. It, his faith put him in a den of lions. His non-negotiable faith put him in a den of lions. His non-negotiable faith put him in the middle of one of the king's wildest parties ever because they needed this writing on the wall translated and needed to know what it said. And it was a judgment. And David told him, what about the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace that we just read about? Them too. They, their non-negotiable faith put them in the fiery furnace, knowing that they're going to be killed. David teaches, or Daniel teaches us, that, the, that living with a non-negotiable faith was a matter of seriousness, of subtle and small choices, not big choices, or small choices we make every day. That's why I said before the end of the day, you're going to have some decisions that will put you in inconvenient situations. And you're probably going to go, man, he just preached about that today. Hello? No one would have blamed him, Daniel, for eating the king's food. It's out of your hands. You can't do nothing about it. He's in charge. That's, that's today. That It's no big deal. Do what you got to do. No one would have blamed him for putting his prayer life on hold. Not stopping it, but, but just, uh, just, just postponing it so that he wouldn't go to the lion's den. That's all he had to do. No one would have blamed the three Hebrew children for saying and bowing down just the one time to the king's idol. 
the king's God to save their life. No one would have blamed them. What many believers, though, see as exceptional exceptions to the rules, these men saw as non-negotiables. Do you have any? Do you have some non-negotiables in your life? Is your faith non-negotiable? It's not the big decisions that determine the quality of our faith. It's the little decisions we make every day, all day long. And so many times we make these decisions that turns us into what we are. Choices. <laughs> even, as a young, even as young men, Daniel and the three Hebrew children had established non-negotiables in their lives and they were living by them. Non-negotiables are more than just a set of religious beliefs that are written down and you just keep checking off. You know, I went to church on Sunday. I went to Bible study. Okay, I went to Tuna Spokes. I did this. No, it's, it's a lot more than that. It refuses to submit to the lies of situational ethics, to political correctness, to the lies that Satan is trying to sell us. And it was immediately seen whose authority these Hebrew men really were bowing down to and living to and submitting to. And it, it was not the perspective of man. It was the divine principles of God. They're non-negotiable. The divine principles of God are non-negotiable. Divine law always supersedes man's law, amen? No matter what the cost is. I pray we never have to make a choice between bowing down and getting killed. But it seems like our country's on track like that. The three Hebrew children refused to bow before anyone but Jehovah, Jehovah and Daniel refused to stop bowing to Jehovah. The Hebrew children refused to accept the rich diet of the king's table because God had shown them a higher principle to live by at that particular time. And the truth you believe is the truth you practice. And they knew they needed to do this. So they went ahead and told the, the guy, he said, no, we, we can't do this. You need, to, you need to take the meat and you need to take the wine away. We're going to just eat vegetables and fruit and water. Some of us can relate to that right now. I constantly discover believers, though, in my life, and I know some of y'all. I'm preaching to the choir, and you're going to be you're, you've 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 got some in your lives, some believers that you know that have more faith in the perspective of man than they do in the divine principles of God. They have allowed the world to filter into their minds, and they've accepted things of this world that God will not accept. He won't have nothing to do with, and He says it's wrong. And yet we accept it. Some of the little things that we say. I got family members that say, what happens at the deer lease stays at the deer lease. Underage drinking. Other things going on. What happens at the deer lease stays at the deer lease. What happens at ROT, Republic of Texas rally? What happens at ROT stays at ROT. You got doctors and lawyers and some people making really, really good money down there doing some things that are just Sodom and Gomorrah all over. But when they go back to work on Monday or Tuesday, what happened at Rot stays at Rot. And they build up for that all year long, save money for it. Do you know over 50% of Christians now are saying that it's okay for a woman to choose and has the right to choose because it's her body? Christians. What happens is when we stay silent about God's divine principles, we let man's perspective filter in and change us. We have bought into Satan's compromises, and we're not standing up for God's divine principles. Because when he said that I knew you before I placed you in your mother's womb, and when he said thou shalt not kill, it ends it. I don't care if you like it. I know people have said the Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. But the truth is, the Bible says it, and whether I believe it or not, <laughs> that settles it. That's just the way it is. The devil's selling us a bunch of compromises, and a lot of us are buying it. Are you buying some of them? I thank God for the Daniels that are still in the world today, and I pray to be one myself. I've been preaching to myself while I was preparing this. God's truth is non-negotiable and needs to be in my life every day, every minute of every day. And I get... Plenty of times to either convey God's divine principles or give in and succumb to man's perspective. And you don't even have to say something. Now, here's the thing. 
I ain't telling you to get that Bible out and start smacking on it and telling your friend or your coworker or your family member. It really, lots of turmoil in the families because the devil tries to tear families apart. The devil's trying to make it to where there is no families anymore. If you don't have one man and one woman, it's hard to have families. You know what I'm saying? And so the devil's trying to tear all that apart. But if you just stay quiet, they call them wimpy Christians, and don't do nothing, you're condoning to man's perspective, surviving. We have to shout out. You all remember that one? The shout out, your faith for Jesus Christ. We had like 27 people up here with a little cone shout out. You, you have to shout out your faith. There's a little story here. A prophet once came to a city to convert all of the city's inhabitants. At first, the people listened to his sermons. They really enjoyed them, and they really made sense, and it was, it was working. But then they gradually started drifting away until there was not a single soul to hear the prophet when he spoke. And he's in an empty temple. You know, what do you call those? Outside amphitheater type deal. And he's screaming the gospel. He's screaming the word. He's all excited. And this traveler walks by and sees this prophet all by himself. And he's like, what are you doing, man? There ain't a single person here for you to preach to. And he said, in the beginning, I hoped to change these people. I hoped to change these people. And now I only shout so that I don't let them change me. Amen. Amen. Are you shouting out for Jesus? Yes. In your actions, in your words. Our actions are so much more powerful than our words most of the time. Our separation from the world through biblical standards and principles is non-negotiable. Our separation should be there. If it's not and you're not feeling that, you need to reevaluate your, your relationship with God today. We will not negotiate with the world to become more acceptable by lowering our standards, which are God's standards. Amen. Daniel proved that his service to God was not for sale. Daniel was a servant to Jehovah first and then to the king second. That's how we should be. A lot of us don't do that. We allow our jobs, we allow our families, we allow our friends to be satisfied before we submit to God. God's always first. Where does your service for God fall? Where does it fall this morning? When you have time for it? When your boss is satisfied? When your family is happy? A sister sitting in here that hadn't been to church for nearly 20 years waiting for the family to be happy and finally said, I quit. I'm going back to be happy and I'm going to start supporting the Lord. Amen? Amen. When your friends and co-workers are not, when, when they're not put out with you because you let them know that what they're doing is wrong. Again, not with the Bible, not beaten, but just there's always openings for you to let people know that that's not right. I still love you, but what you're doing is not right. It's not of God, and I don't want you to go to hell. There's a difference between sinning and repenting and then sinning and repenting. How many of y'all been there? <laughs> sinning and repenting. Sin, there we go. Get all of you that's got your hands up, or you're really working on the trust and you're truthful and, and integrity here. I, I had mine up first. But when you sin and condone it, you sin and condone it, you sin, you're living, you're practicing sin. That's the difference. See, we're all sinners and we fall short of God's glory. But when we sin and then we say, man, I'm really, man, I'm really sorry, God. I, help me not do that again. You're on the right track. But when you allow man's perspective to convince you that you're okay with what you're doing, you're living in sin, you're practicing sin, and you're destined for hell. You're not on the highway to heaven. Okay? God is looking for men like Daniel who are sold out to him. The three Hebrew children are the best example of this principle in their statement to the king. I think this is the last verse. Daniel chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. If it be so... Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning. I got them both on there. Deliver us from burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, remember that message? But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Even though my God can. He can, re he, can, he can save me from this fiery furnace. But if not, I don't care. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. 
my God has divine principles set forth and they're non-negotiable. I'm going to burn in the fire if he doesn't want to re, re, retake me out of the fire. That's non-negotiable faith. That's what we should strive for. No matter the consequences, their faith stands still on non-negotiable faith. Are you willing to have that faith that may cost you your life? I pray that I never have to come to that. I pray that our country starts turning really, really hard back towards God's principles. Right now, our country doesn't even believe it was founded on Christian principles. Our kids are taught in school. They're not taught anything about our founding fathers being Christian. 52 out of 56? I mean, come on. All you got to do is do the history yourself. Google it. I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail. But it cost Moses Pharaoh's palace and authority. Moses was there. He had a silver spoon in his mouth. It cost the Apostle Paul his position as a Pharisee. He was the son of a Pharisee. Another guy with a spoon in his mouth. It cost a brother in Gatesville his job. It cost me my job too. I was asked to lie a long time ago. And I refused to. But God has blessed me since. And blessed him with a business. Amen. It can cost you a friendship. And that's the one that's the hardest. Because these others are so way back. And you're like, well, it's not like that right now. But there's so many of us that have lost friends because we've stood on God's principles. We've applied them to our lives. And then we get shunned by our friends. And they just disappear. And we don't want to hurt our friends. We have really close friends like family. And we don't. We don't that's emotions. We don't want to hurt our friends' emotions. We don't want a, a long-term relationship be severed because of God's divine principles. So we condone. We accept. Not tolerate, but we accept their lifestyles. We accept what they're doing wrong in life by allowing them to think that we think it's okay. By even joining them in certain organizations that says it's okay. That is not of God. Now, what point do we reach where we're sinning? God gives each and every one of us a responsibility. My responsibility up here is for your salvation. I have to answer to God that I am keeping you on the right track. Now, if I was to stand up here and tell you things of this world are okay, I'd be having to answer to him for anybody that didn't go to see Jesus because they believe that. You know what I'm saying? Non-negotiable faith cost Jesus Christ his life. It cost him his life. And he died to take all those sins onto him that you and I commit every day, have committed, and will tomorrow. We can only stand such a test when we value what we have, our salvation, more than what we're going to lose, which is material things and our life, physical life. Jesus describes this attitude in the parable of the pearl of great price. We will never effectively serve God until we're ready to give up everything just for Him. And I'm telling you, if you take this to heart, you're going to lose friends. But do it out of love. Because a lot of them come back. Daniel and the three Hebrew children valued the God they served more than their lives, more than those relationships. Daniel had to be a firm believer that the path he had chosen was the best path, the best plan for his life. And so must we. All that life needs to be for you and me is wrapped up in one little package and it's called Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He's all the direction we ever need. He is the way. That's another thing of the world now. So many Christians. Do you know there's 67% of the Christians that don't believe in absolute truth anymore? They don't believe in absolute truth. What I mean is good, God-fearing Spirit-filled or blood-bought, whatever, saints of God, believe they're, on, they're destined for heaven. And 67% of them don't believe that, God's, that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. That's an absolute truth. Well, I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. But I can't really judge those people. You're not judging them. Your obligation from God is to teach them and tell them. And when you keep your mouth shut, you're condoning, you're agreeing, you're accepting, you're helping them, you're an enabler, and they're on the highway to hell, not the highway to heaven. God is the way. He is the revelation, all the revelation we ever needed. He is the truth. He's all the fulfillment we ever needed. He is our life. You can take a stand even when it costs you. If you know without a doubt, He's still in charge of your life.
I pray as this message has touched each and one of you in a special way. I pray that it's provided you with some insight about what you're not focused on, where you need to be focused, and about non-negotiable faith. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you again for another powerful message that each one of us had, had to really hear. I ask that you show each and every one of us right now one particular thing, an event that's happened in the last week. Let us, let us all see right now that inconvenient situation, that uncomfortable circumstance that we messed up on. And now, Lord, I ask you to help us see the next one and be more godlike. Let us stand on the non-negotiable faith that you provide. We ask all this in Jesus' mighty and most precious name. Amen and amen.